Hey, good morning. Good to be here with you in this space online. We're so glad that you're with us well. Let me, uh, as well, let me just reiterate two things in case you missed it. Next Sunday is Cupcake Sunday. I know that there are going to be 200 cupcakes here in this building. Pretty excited about that myself, I'd say. Uh, and so, yeah, make sure you're here. Bring your family and friends. If you're online and you are local, you can join us as well. It'll be in between the two services, Madhouse Cupcake Display. So it's exciting. And also, uh, today is Super Bowl Sunday. My obligatory Go Eagles. All right. We have, all right. Very good. And uh, also on this day here in this place is, uh, this is the super pregame party for our youth ministry. It's a big event really, really important event where our, our uh, middle school and high school students can invite their friends to be part of a fun time, lots of food, all those kinds of things. If you're here in this space and you want to help out, uh, you come back at about 1130 so we can clear this, uh, these chairs out, okay? So you run out, run to the diner, and then you can get back here, all right? If you're online, same thing. You can come over about 1130 and help that, uh, the in-person crowd who will be here because we're not going to let them leave until the chairs are out of the space, all right? So you can help them out, and that would be great. And so uh, thanks for doing that. So in 2008, Malcolm Gladwell, many of you heard of him, wrote a book called Outliers, and in that book, he kind of made famous this idea that if you commit to something for 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours of intensive practice, that you can master a complex skill. And that could be something in sports, it could be music, it really could be any skill. If you commit to 10,000 hours of practice. He said those that master a skill, it's because of their dedication to 10,000 hours. And Gladwell said this in his book Outliers. He said, once a musician has enough ability to get into a top school, the thing that distinguishes one performer from another is how hard he or she works. And then Malcolm Gladwell added these two words. He said, that's it. 10,000 hours of hard work, and that's it. That you will achieve mastery in a complex skill. Now, just to help you understand 10,000 hours, that's 417 days of hours. A little over, well, more than a year. I'm not good with math. Or, if that's not enough to impress how much 10,000 hours is, it's three hours a day of practice for 3,333 days. Three hours of practice every day for over 3,000 days, a little over nine years. In sports, an example would be LeBron James, who this week surpass the scoring of any other professional athlete in the bas in National Basketball Association. 30, how many, 39,000? Close to, he'll have that easily. I am sure LeBron James has put in 10,000 hours of practice. Another example locally, Susie Wilson. She was just playing the piano, all right? <laughs> I am sure, I didn't ask her this, but I am sure Susie has put in 10,000 hours of practice, that she has put in three hours a day, maybe not three hours a day, but she has put in over nine years of practice. This is also the first time in church history where LeBron James and Susie Wilson were mentioned <laughs> in the same sentence. Just want to say that too, all right? So there you go. So according to Gladwell, what he's saying is that if you get better with practice and with a lot of practice, 10,000 hours will lead to mastery. That was in 2008. Then I heard a podcast this week, last week, ruined everything for me. <laughs> the podcast was with a guy named Anders Ericsson. Now, Anders Ericsson is a professor of psychology at Florida State University, and it was his research 
that was used by Malcolm Gladwell and made famous by Gladwell in his book, Outliers. And in it, Anders says practice is important. And 10,000 hours of dedication will master complicated skills. But Erickson said there is one thing Gladwell missed. It's not practice, and that's it. It's how good is a student's teacher. Erickson's research says that someone can practice for thousands of hours and still not be a master. <laughs> Folks, that's my golf game. <laughs> I am almost positive that I have put in 10,000 hours and my score doesn't improve. I've put in the hours. I want to blame the teachers. <laughs> See, what he said, Erickson said, is that they could be outplayed by someone who practiced less, but had a teacher who showed them just what to focus on at a key moment in their practice regimen. See, back to my golf game. I have too many things to unlearn before I can learn. And so 10,000 hours is not enough. Now let's apply that to our spiritual lives or to our church life, that we can learn something interesting and challenging from this, that as disciples or as learners, our faith, as we're practicing and learning our faith, that when we commit to practicing Practice says, I don't have it all figured out. And I'm going to keep practicing to get better. And we want to master a skill. What is that skill? We talk about it. Conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. But the question we have to challenge ourselves is, what are we practicing? See, if we're not careful, the church... Or we as individuals can practice the wrong things. And sadly, that has been the fate of the church over centuries. Our history speaks to practicing the wrong things. The Crusades in Europe, a perverted military version of evangelism. Missionaries to the Americas. Conversion of an indigenous people group forced baptisms, slavery for centuries, wrongly interpreted texts and teachings to subject people. And more recently, and we could go on and on with these things, divorce, gender, marriage, other cultural hot topics, et cetera, et cetera, Etc. Through history, the church has been practicing for hours and hours, and in sometimes practicing wrongly. It's not all depressing, folks. It's going to get better, I promise here. <laughs> See, according to Gladwell, we may accomplish something, but according to Erickson, what we accomplish is wrong if we've practiced the wrong things. So today is the last week in our series that we're calling Different, and I want to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and I think I'm going to be able to connect this idea of practice into our lives. But before I do that, let's read this text, uh, this part of the letter that we've been looking at for the last, uh, I think this is the fifth week. So up on the screen it says this, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. Peter says, arm yourselves with the same attitude that Jesus had. In the uh, literal translation, it is you have the same mind as Christ. In the Amplified Version, it says, arm yourselves with the same thought and 
purpose as Jesus. And in the message, learn to think like him. Learn to think like Jesus. So if Jesus is our model, and Jesus is our goal, and I think we could say Jesus is our teacher, here's the takeaway, not only for today, but for the whole series. Being different isn't practice, but posture. It's not about practice, it's about posture. So if you gotta leave, that's it. <laughs> but I've got 15 minutes to kinda unpack that, and I hope you'll stay. You see, for some of us, faith is about checking boxes. For some, I was talking to someone uh, on Friday night that our faith was um, about filling in the blanks and a list of do's and don'ts, right? Read your Bible, pray, give money to the church, don't drink, don't smoke, and don't hang out with people who do. I remember that was kind of my upbringing for part of that, of my early years. I didn't follow any of it, but that was kind of <laughs> what I was told. And these are not bad things to practice. And I practice most of those things myself. But practicing without a good teacher or a good model, at best, that leads to 10,000 hours of memorizing the length of Noah's Ark and other trivial Bible facts. And I've met quite a few folks who have spent 10,000 hours and they can give me lots of Bible trivia. At its worst, it also leads to judgment anger, hostility towards others, arrogance, legality. And we see Jesus speaking to the Pharisees about that, and I'm sure you've met some who have been like that as well. And so like my golf game, for many of us, or for some of us, we've had to grow up in this faith, unlearning bad habits that we've learned over 10,000 hours. But our purpose is to practice our posture to develop the same thought and mind as Jesus, to have the same attitude or the same heart as Jesus. It's about practicing our posture, practicing this attitude of Jesus so that we can think and act and respond and be like him. That Christianity isn't a list of things to do. It's a way of life. And Jesus says it's the best way of living in this world. So that when we read the Bible, we read the Bible not for trivia, but to see Jesus. We pray not to check off a box, but because we believe we are connecting to a God who loves us fully. That we give generously because Jesus showed us that a generous life leads to the best life and the best way to live this life. Now, Peter says another thing just a few verses later. Again, it's going to be on the screen. He says, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God. Now, let me just... Uh, pause for a second. We talked about, Pastor Jeff talked about this uh, at the beginning of this series, and I've mentioned it as well, is that this is a people group who are being oppressed by the Roman Empire, and so suffering is a theme that uh, Peter mentions throughout. So he's talking about suffering. Let's just, for our purposes in the 21st century, it's about just living this life. Don't, don't imagine your suffering, all right? Because for most of us, that's not how the world works right now, right? Life is hard, Sure, God is good. Yes, yes. I'm not saying that isn't true too. God is good. It was Susie who put 10,000 hours into the piano, so she's allowed to say that, and we're all good. All right. Uh, but but so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, if you're just living this life here on earth, if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, He says, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for He will never fail you. A failure. A follower of Jesus is supposed to show up in the world with the right posture. 
that we do what is right in the same way that Jesus would do what is right. And we trust God with the results. So that means we do what is right at work and we do what is right at school and we do what is right in our neighborhoods. I said last week, we seek justice, we love mercy and walk humbly with God, that we don't cut corners, that we don't compromise our values, that we don't shy away from the truth. But you see, without the correct posture, our Christian practices don't matter. You see, because you can pray before meals and still be a jerk. (laughs) You can read the Bible every morning, but then go to work and cheat and exploit people. You can evangelize on street corners and ignore the poor on the same corner. See, Christianity is about practicing the attitude of Jesus. It's about a posture of thinking like Jesus and growing a heart like Jesus. It's about practicing a lifestyle of a Christ-like posture that when we learn this, we have to learn this posture because it doesn't come natural to us. In many ways, it's the opposite of what we're born with. That's why over the next couple of years, you'll hear us talking often about worship plus two. It's a challenge that, a practice that we want to have all of us be a part of, that we're learning together what to practice so that we can practice our posture. So worship plus two is worship. We think that we we want everyone to be part of this worshiping community or a worshiping community, whether you're worshiping online or worshiping here. We want you to be a part of that because we believe when we're together as community worshiping God, we can grow and be inspired and challenged and committed to this world that people would know Jesus. That not only do we want to worship, but it's plus two. We want everyone who considers this their church home, that they be invested in it by volunteering. That you're part of the body of Christ. That you're committed to seeing this place introduce others to Jesus. And that you're part of a small group. See, because as we practice our posture, we need people around us who will say, that's not really good. Or you're doing that really well. Because when we are committed to worship plus two, we're committing to the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And together as the body of Christ, we learn to practice a posture so that our minds and our hearts or like Jesus. Now you might be thinking, hey, I already do that. I got that. Worship, volunteer, small group, I'm in. And I would say that's great. But you know what I've discovered? My posture still needs work. And there are times where when I'm practicing my posture, an occasional bad habit creeps up. And so I still need to be in a small group. I love my small group. We talked about this. Usually they get a little preview of the message when this week's I'm preaching. And so the challenge then for those of us who are doing those things, who can you bring alongside to do it with you? Who could you say, hey, I'd love for you to be part of this community where we worship and we invest together and we are growing in our faith and community. I'd love for you to be a part of that. Join my small group. Volunteer with me. If you don't listen to our podcast, let me encourage you. Just listen to this one episode. This week, all right, uh, Bill and Kelly Willenda, they're here in this space. I'm not going to point them out. <laughs> but they, I love their interview because they shared, and they'll talk to you about it. I know they will. They talked about how those things, coming to worship, 
volunteering and being in a small group has changed their lives. And I'm just, they're going to say that. They said it in the podcast. They're going to say, they would say that to you if you asked them how God has changed their lives because of those things. Their posture is changing. And when we choose to practice posture, it leads to opportunity. It always leads to opportunity. And we've shared this often. I know I've said it a lot, that there was this infectious growth that took place in the first century, that people lived these attractive lives and they practiced their posture and it impacted their homes and their neighborhoods and their towns. And practice, now let me, let me just explain. So I'm, I've been saying practice and posture and we practice our posture. Let me, let me show you how that works outside this building. When you take out your trash cans, that's practice. When you're coaching a soccer team, that's practice. When you're in line at the grocery store, when you're sitting in on meetings at work, when you're walking your kids to the bus stop, those are all practices and so many more. I would argue that everything you do is a practice of practicing your posture. Our posture is our attitude, right? It's having the mind and heart of Christ. So when I'm taking my trash cans to the curb, am I exhibiting love and joy and humility and faithfulness and generosity while I practice the activities of life? Do I look like Jesus when I'm taking my trash cans out to the curb? And I know that sounds odd, but I, I, I'm telling you, it's a practice for me. When I take my trash cans out, because I say that to you often up here, I think of it when I'm in my neighborhood. What am I doing to be Jesus as I take my trash cans out? So that means when I see my neighbors do I just go huh and walk away or do I say how are you and I really mean it because I believe if Jesus were to take out his trash cans that's what he would do and so that's why you'll hear us talking often over the next three years about one by one because when we're outside this building and we have our practice of our posture in order, then opportunities happen in the same way that Jesus would serve, I can serve. That there will be opportunities to listen the same way that Jesus would listen. That there will be opportunities to support someone in need and encourage someone to invite someone to a relationship with Jesus. So Peter had this to say, and I believe this part of his letter was directed towards the church for when they're outside the building. I can't say that for sure, but that's what I want to believe it is. And it's, again, I think it's going to be on the screen, yes. It's from chapter 3, and I'm wrapping up with this thought. So Peter says this, Finally, all of you should be of one mind sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, and here Peter is quoting from Psalm 34, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days. I mean, who doesn't, right? Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Do you hear the challenges Peter gives? He says, we can be together unified unity we can demonstrate sympathy we can show love and tenderness and humility and forgiveness and blessing and honesty and goodness and peace what a great offering to the world if the body of christ demonstrated that posture that you can demonstrate that posture 
the world. It's why I talk about being in the grocery store line. It's a challenge for me. I believe it's a challenge for each of us. But how you stand in the grocery line, your posture in the grocery store line, if you're nice, that's noticed. It's a difference in our world. And people will note that. How you coach soccer, how you speak to someone else's children on the soccer field demonstrates a difference and a posture of Jesus. How you speak to your kids' teachers, how you work at your work matters. And you may think no one's looking, but your posture is noted. Peter said, do what is right and trust your lives to God. See, as followers of Jesus, we answer hate with love. We find joy in the midst of trials. We choose to rely on a strength beyond ourselves. We live different. And it is not in religious practices, but it is practicing a posture so that we look and sound and act like Jesus. And that will change the world. That will change your neighborhood. That will change your workplace. And that infectious experience is how we bring the kingdom of God into this earth and into this world. We stand with me for closing prayer. If you're online, if you stay with us as we pray together as one church in all our places, let's pray together. And so, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you are our teacher, our model, our goal. God, that we want to be, I pray that we want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that we want to look and sound like you. And I pray, God, that we as a body of Christ in all of our places would be committed to that. And that, God, we would then, as we look and sound and act like you, that as Peter challenges the church in his letter, that we would be love and joy and peace, that we would serve and impact the world around us, that, God, we would demonstrate kindness with everyday tasks as we live out this life. God, that the world would note the difference in the way we live. And that, God, people would know that it's because of what you've done in our hearts and in our lives. Because, God, that's our desire, that our lives would be the example, would be an act of service to those around us. And, God, I pray that that would be our desire each of our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.